Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this webinar co-hosted by Viewed and DataAxis. Uh, the presentation will be dedicated to the challenges that are triggered by the evolution of the pay TV market and the emergence of new functionalities uh, that can be provided. And we'll try to understand how operators can overcome the limitations of the set-top box hardware performance. The regional focus of the presentation will be set on uh, countries in Asia Pacific, with uh, China excluded. The webinar will last around 30 minutes, uh, with an additional 10-15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions, you can type them during the session, they will be answered at the end. I am Saïba Nibier, analyst at DataXis. Uh, we specialize in market research and conferences on media topics. Marco Fratulin and Chris Carter, uh, respectively head of operator product and product marketing manager, will provide analysis and insights on strategies that can be deployed to address the UX issues. And I will let them give you more details about viewed activities later on in the presentation. So let's start first with a, a quick update uh, on the market. If we look at the region's characteristics, uh, first we see that it comprises of uh, around 3 billion inhabitants. Uh, and uh, within these 3 billion, uh, we have India accounting for almost half of the total. Uh, there are around 700 million households uh, and the TV penetration reached uh, 70 73 percent in 2019. The pay TV penetration is a bit lower at 63 uh, percent and this represents around uh, 320 million pay TV subscribers. And uh, within the region uh, it is very contrasted in terms of uh, profile. Uh, we have India and South countries uh, that have a high penetration of pay TV but it is mostly dominated by uh, low-priced cable. Uh, Southeast Asia is uh, is very diverse. Uh, the pay TV penetration goes from seven uh, percent uh, in Myanmar, for instance, to ninety three percent in Singapore. Uh, and then there are uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, also Japan and Korea, that are more advanced in terms of uh, penetration and technologies. Uh, and on the access side, uh, we see that growth is observed for cable, DTH, IPTV, and OTT, uh, almost all the, the TV distribution uh, technologies. Uh, and the market remains dominated by cable. So this is partly due to uh, the weight of India in the region. Uh, DTH uh, is also growing. It allows to, to reach areas where the infrastructures are sometimes lacking. And the most advanced technologies, IPTV and OTT, have started to grow. Uh, and the increase is expected to be even more important in the coming years, driven by the increase in connectivity that is observed in the region. And this is what, uh, what's illustrated here. Uh, we observe a, a growing penetration of mobile and uh, fixed broadband services. And what is striking uh, here is the increase of the most advanced technologies uh, that is translating into uh, an improved quality, uh, an improved uh, bandwidth speed. So we see that uh, data only uh, mobile, which uh, accounts for the uh, USB data cards, um, but also cable and DSL uh, are all accesses that are declining. Uh, and at the same time, fiber uh, is observing, uh, we is experiencing the strongest growth. And this trend is observed in, uh, in many countries of the region. So we can imagine that uh, the increase in penetration uh, and the penetration only represents 40% of households in 2019. Uh, this increase will go along with the development of fiber, uh, granting access to a growing number of households uh, over the years. And broadband access uh, and the way it's accessed, uh, it has consequences when it comes to uh, developing OTT services, uh, either as a standalone offer or to enhance an existing uh, content distribution offer. So we have examples here. Uh, we see that the SVOD uh, subscriber numbers reached around 54 million in 2019, uh, and the increase has been significant in the past years. Uh, we expect uh, this uh, rapid growth to continue in the coming years. 
the number of actors is also multiplying and we can see it here. Uh, the chart on the right gives an idea of the fragmentation of the market. So we see that the international platforms like Netflix and Amazon uh, are there, but there are also numerous local platforms, uh, Hotstar, Aerosnow, Z from India, for instance, uh, Rakuten from Japan or iFlix from Malaysia. So in uh, Asia Pacific, the specificities of each market make it difficult uh, to address them as, a, as one whole market uh, with one single platform. So to, um, to sum up the characteristics of the region, uh, the pay TV market and content distribution players are changing rapidly uh, under the impulse of uh, more advanced technologies, uh, the rise of OTT offers and distribution. And it can represent a challenge for operators to adapt to the new standards of the market. Standards that can be uh, more flexibility, uh, more advanced uh, navigation features, for instance. But uh, so it can be a challenge, but these fun new functionalities can also be leveraged by the operators to enhance their offer. And uh, these developments uh, will be the focus of, uh, of the rest of the presentation. So I will uh, now give the hand to Chris for a more detailed uh, analysis of the UX features. Uh, thank you, Saeva. Um, and hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Carter, Product Marketing Lead. Uh, we've called our webinar Freeing the UX from the Limitations of Set-Top Box Hardware Performance. So why would you need to do that? Uh, the problem is that there is a constant stream of new TV services and features launched every day. This means that the demands on the set-top box are growing all the time. Operators have to respond to this in order to remain competitive. Generally, this means that each new generation of set-top box has to be capable of new levels of complexity. But it doesn't stop there. The user experience in your new set-top box may be state-of-the-art when it's released, but it won't stay that way for long because the evolutionary process still continues after launch. Of course, software updates can be rolled out at extra cost and risk, but the performance and capability of the hardware in the home is fixed, limiting what's possible. This is a major competitive disadvantage for operators compared with the always up-to-date services delivered by pure OTT providers. OTT providers update their apps whenever they want. Plus, they rely on users to provide hardware so they don't have to bear the cost of upgrades. So how can operators with managed hardware compete with this? Today, we'll look at the solutions to this problem. Before we do that, though, here is a run through of today's agenda. We've already heard from Save on the status of the market in this region, and we've had a brief introduction from me. So here is the list of remaining topics for the day. First, I'll give a very short introduction to Viewed for those not fully familiar with who we are. Then in the UX in constant flux section, I'll give an overview of some of the features of the market that are driving this constant evolution and its associated set-top box UX requirements. After that, I'll cover the options that operators have for dealing with this constant change. From item four onwards, I'll hand over to Marco. Marco will give more detail on how a cloud browser solution can help operators solve the problem of future-proofing their systems. This will come with some example use cases and some things to take into account when considering a deployment. Then after a brief summary, we'll take questions, as Saeva mentioned, uh, and also go through any questions that have already been submitted. So first, who are Viewed? Uh, Viewed has been in the TV software business for around 17 years. Until 2016, we were the Opera TV business unit of Opera Software but now we're a separate company. Throughout our history, our mission has always been to enable customers to add OTT content and services to their TV devices. We do this by providing software that renders any online content on the TV screen. This is essentially what Viewed Core, our most famous product does. Over time, we've added more products to our range. So today we help our customers more generally to exploit the opportunities created when TV devices are connected to broadband. We won't go into the details of all these products today, uh, but you'll see an example of one of them. In this particular slide, we show the type of devices where our technology is used. Not surprisingly, 
Uh, we are deploying in smart TVs and set-top boxes of all kinds. We also have some business in in-car entertainment systems, as these share some of the same requirements as TV-connected devices. So what does that mean in terms of numbers? We are a global company of over 200 people, with development mostly in Europe. In addition, we have teams local to our customers in all the major regions. In Asia, our teams are in China, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, with coverage across the region. With deployments in 170 countries, you can see that our technology is used in most corners of the world. Owing to our presence in volume consumer devices, we deploy around 40 million additional units each year. This gives us an install base of around 300 million units. So as well as providing device technology, we also represent a huge platform for content distribution. Anyway, enough about viewed. Uh, now we move on to a, a short summary of typical things that are causing the constant evolution in the user experience that I mentioned before. As we know, the number of OTT apps grows continuously, with new apps constantly being launched. This chart is for the US and, of course, shows the same trend. So as we can see, operators need to constantly refine their offering to make the la latest popular apps available to their subscribers. Of course, even if there are no new apps, the popularity of different apps varies over time. No doubt Disney Plus, HBO Max and Peacock will change the order in this US slide for 2020. So how apps are promoted needs to regularly vary in order to keep the most popular apps in front of subscribers. The other characteristic of apps is that they are often upgraded as providers improve their offerings with new features. Operators need an efficient way to manage this dynamic. In addition, it's not just the apps, but also the UX itself that needs to evolve. Consumer expectations change all the time as they interact with other devices. They bring these same expectations to the TV. Plus, over time, new service categories appear. Originally, operators only had to provide live TV and a guide. Then, with widespread broadband availability, operator VOD became a requirement. Similarly, broadcasters took advantage of the same trends in broadband to add catch-up and restart services. These also now have to be supported. And of course, SVOD and AVOD services came along and they have to be included as well. More recently, gaming is becoming an, a feature and in the future, no doubt more categories will come into existence. These category, category changes impact not only the content, but also the structure of the UX that operators need to offer over time. The final driver is the availability of low-cost cloud computing. This creates opportunities to exploit the vast amounts of data that operators have access to or can generate. Some of these opportunities are operational only, but many have a direct impact on the consumer's experience of the service. They may affect how the UX should be laid out, how it is structured to shorten the route to content, what types of services are featured more prominently, and other variations that insights from the data might suggest. Other data-driven services may also impact the UX. For example, responses from a voice assistant may need to be placed on the screen. These things are driving a need for continuous upgradability of the UX. So what is here? deployed across the entire install base, maximizing take up. New business ideas can be tried out and tested before rollout across the footprint to ensure that the investment is really worth it. Having all subscribers on the same version of apps and services makes support easier and less costly. And possibly the most significant, software upgrades or box swap outs are not necessary to maintain the service at the current state of the art. This saves both CapEx and OpEx, as well as providing a better service all round. So how can it be done? Here are the three main options. This is the typical connected set-top box model. The set-top box receives both broadcast and online content, 
and delivers them to the TV in a combined UX that is embedded in the box. In this case, upgradability can be achieved by using cloud services to generate some of the elements of the UX. For example, the content catalog, recommendations, promotions, an app store, and things like that. The box has a fixed framework embedded in its UX to support this. Apps and services all run in the box, so it has to have sufficient power to support that. Ideally, the box also has to have power to support any services that may be offered over its lifetime, which could be eight to 10 years. Generally, though, this is not possible for cost reasons. In any case, upgrades to support major new features may require an update to the software in the box. This can be costly and time consuming, owing to the integration and certification that has to be carried out. There is also a software upgrade process that has to be rolled out. Generally, this is only possible for a few years after the box is first deployed. Over time, it becomes more and more difficult to maintain fragmenting software profiles. So in summary, this solution can be personalized and it is upgradable, but probably not for the whole lifetime of the box. Its cloud load is minimal, but the baseline cost of the box is high. The second model uses a set-top box that contains a thin client. The box in this case receives the OTT service together with its UX transcoded so as to look like just another broadcast channel. This greatly simplifies the demands on the set-top box, both in terms of software complexity and of hardware cost. The trade-off is that a virtual set-top box has to be created in the cloud. This decodes and decrypts the incoming video, adds the corresponding UX, and then transcodes and re-encrypts everything before sending it to the home. The benefit of this is that the virtual set-top box is fully personalizable and upgradable. The downside is that transcoding is a heavy load on the cloud, cloud server, as is the continuous streaming required from the cloud to the box. Both can be costly when scaled. This option is uniquely advantageous for very low performance boxes. Typically, these are legacy boxes though. It is often difficult to access these old boxes to add the required thin client, either for technical or for business reasons. In summary, this solution can be personalized, is upgradable, and can run on very low cost hardware, but it can be expensive in terms of load on the cloud. It may also present practical difficulties in those markets where it is best suited. The final option, and in our view, often a better compromise, is the cloud browser model shown here. In this case, the broadcast and OTT video are not intercepted in the cloud, but are sent directly to the box. The video retains its content protection, maintaining security. Other streaming features stay intact, and the video is decoded in the box in the normal way by the device's internal decoder. If necessary, the thin client's built-in software can be used to play any media types not supported by the hardware. At the same time, the UX is generated in the cloud based on the operator's rules. This is then compressed and sent to the box to be combined with the video for display. As UXs are relatively static compared to video, both the cloud bandwidth and processing load are low and hence much less costly than for the virtual box case. The thin client, as it is essentially an expanded media player, can run on any modern low cost set top box. As all the non-video processing is done in the cloud, the service is fully upgradable and, as with all these solutions, can be personalised. If the operator has other services that absolutely must run in the box, then these can easily be integrated with the thin client, assuming the box has hardware that supports them. This allows the operator to offer a scalable range of boxes supporting different segments of the market. So in this case, the solution can be personalised, it is fully upgradable, it can run on almost any set-top box, and the burden on cloud infrastructure is low, the best of all worlds. Of course, this final option assumes that there is a cloud out there. At this point, I'll hand over to Marco to tell you about such a solution from Viewed. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Marco Fratolin speaking. Let me just take over the screen sharing. So now I think you all see uh, my viewed uh, Atom slides. So as, uh, as Chris mentioned, at Viewed, we believe that the, the, the best uh, 
approach to take advantage of cloud speed and flexibility and at the same time contain costs is a cloud browser. And Vue.atom is our cloud browser product. Um, as a cloud browser, it is made by two parts. So there is a modern browser engine uh, which runs in the cloud or more generally on the server side. And this is based on the latest Chromium HTML5 engine um, with our, uh, of course, patches and the modifications. And then there is a thin client running on the target set of box, which uh, receives the UI encoded by the browser in the cloud and plays the OTT video. And the combinations and the, the combination of these two elements make it possible to deliver the same HTML modern experience on any hardware. And it also allows to uh, deliver and run the same UI and applications on many different set of box models of different, uh, uh, different capabilities. So let's have a look at some key uh, aspects of, of Viewed Atom. So the first important point is that Viewed Atom enables full HTML5 support on every device. And since the cloud part is based on uh, the latest Chromium, this is basically like having the latest Chromium browser running on, uh, on every device, uh, uh, which means that uh, Viewed Atom supports the latest frameworks and tools to uh, create user interfaces and applications. It supports all uh, video APIs, HTML video element and, uh, and, uh, and the likes. Uh, a few uh, specific features that we can offer are that we also support Canvas, which is very important for applications uh, such as games. And we also support MSC EME. Now, this is a, a little bit uh, complicated to explain, maybe, and I'll, I'll get to this uh, later. But the support for MSC EME is one of the key features of Build Atom. And thanks to our approach where we uh, separate the UI part from the video, uh, video streaming part, we are able to have an OTT HTML5 application running on the cloud browser. But at the same time, the thin client performs the video download and the bandwidth estimations that are necessary for adaptive streaming protocols. And this allows us to offer support for MSC APIs on um, for OTT applications running on the cloud. And then if necessary, we can also offer persistent memory for uh, cookies if, uh, if necessary. Th there are cases where that is not advisable, but if necessary, we can, we can do it. So the benefits of full HTML5 support on every device are quite uh, uh, clear. Uh, this makes possible to run uh, user interfaces and apps transparently on any box. The costs of uh, creating and especially maintaining and validating UX and apps on, uh, on many devices are uh, much lower because it is only necessary to validate the UI on one platform. And, th and that platform is Chromium running uh, on, a, on a server. So it's a, it's a very good platform. Uh, it also allows to expand the target footprint of devices and uh, deploy additional advanced features and services on a set of boxes that normally could not support that. The time to market for a new uh, feature is uh, much shorter and the innovation cycle, the innovation cycle is faster because the up, up, uh, updates are much uh, easier. An update of the user experience or an update of the app uh, is basically the same as uh, uh, launching a new website. So you, you, uh, you only have to load a new URL on the, on the server on the, on the cloud uh, uh, browser, and it is not necessary to plan and deploy uh, firmware updates on set, uh, devices in field. And of course, as an HTML5 platform, uh, the cloud, uh, our cloud browser, Atom is pre-integrated with our other HTML5 uh, products, specifically viewed OPEX, Operator Experience, our UI, and all the apps in our app, app store. Um, a central aspect of uh, Viewed Atom 
architecture is our hybrid approach to uh, content streaming. So basically what, uh, what happens when the UI or an OTT app runs in the, in the cloud is that uh, there are two parts to it. The, the, the first part is the video streaming and viewed atom does not touch that. The, the video streaming part is intact. So the uh, video content, uh, for example, a, a movie or a linear TV channel or an OTT clip. So the, the audio video content is streamed directly from the original content uh, server or CDN to the Atom client, to the box. This means that Viewed Atom does not introduce any extra uh, transcoding or any additional CPU and bandwidth requirement for the, for the video as, uh, as, uh, as such. On the other side, the UI uh, is rendered in the cloud browser, then it is encoded as an H.264 stream or a sequence of JPEG. Uh, this choice depends on many different factors and details, and we can change in real time be between the, the two options uh, according to what is optimal. So the, the UI is encoded, and then it is uh, streamed to the, to the client. And for UI streaming, we take advantage of uh, adaptive bitrate, um, like MPEG dash. We also support variable uh, frame rate, so that we only take as much bandwidth as, as it's needed to ensure a smooth user e experience. And we only do that when the UI actually changes uh, on the screen, because the end user is uh, interacting with it. This means that if the user interface on, in, on the TV screen does not change or is not active because the user is watching video full screen or because the end user is not uh, navigating through the menu, in these cases, we don't consume any CPU and any bandwidth. And this is possible thanks to this uh, hybrid approach where video and UI are uh, separate. Now, this uh, still uh, allows to mix the two uh, streams in the in the client, so you can still implement uh, effects such as uh, picture in graphics or alpha blending or UI over video and so on and so forth. This is uh, fully possible and it is implemented by the Atom client. So the benefits of this uh, hybrid approach um, are, uh, of course, that the uh, like server infrastructure is uh, super efficient. Um, it, the, the UX is uh, always responsive because the uh, Atom server in real time can encode it and, uh, and deliver it to the, to the box. And this works over any IP network, including over the open internet. The, the basic rule of thumb is that if an IP connection is good enough to deliver OTT video, uh, then it is also good to use Atom because the additional bandwidth taken by the UI is, uh, is lower, and most of the bandwidth is allocated to, to the video stream anyway. And of course, last but not least, um, the end-to-end -end, uh, video security is intact, because the encryption and the DRM is, uh, is, is not impacted by viewed Atom. Uh, a question that we get very often is, what about latency? Because, of course, a, a cloud browser infrastructure uh, introduces a couple of extra operations in the, in the chain of events between the moment when the end user uh, pushes a button in the remote control to the moment where something has to happen in the UI. So it's uh, understandable that, that people like wonder uh, what is the impact on, on latency. And here in this slide, I want to explain that uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a problem in almost any, any, any case. So let me explain you why. So if we consider an application running locally, then of course it will have its own latency uh, based on the RCU input event handling, the, the application running on a, on a local browser and the, and the, UI, and the UI rendering. Uh, then if you run the same, same HTML5 application on a cloud browser, then you are uh, introducing two extra uh, latency contributions. 
The first is a network uh, round trip because input events have to be sent from the client to, to the cloud. And then the UI has to be sent back from the cloud to the client. So there is one network uh, round trip. And then you have the Atom uh, software running on the client and the server, which of course takes a, a bit of time as, as well. So in our experience, these two contributions are typically around 100 milliseconds, more or less. Uh, so it is, it is not a, a, a big contribution really, but there is, there is more to that. There is also a, a negative contribution, uh, which is that the application running on the server is much faster. So typically the latest Chromium build running on a cloud server or on a, on a, on a normal server has much better performance than the same application running on the client. And this increased speed uh, does compensate the, the additional latency introduced by the cloud setup. So in most cases, this extra performance by the application basically is uh, re reducing significantly the, the latency added by Atom, which means that at the end of the day, the, the application running on Atom is more or less has the same, the same latency as a, as a local application. There are we seen as well. The application is very complex. And so uh, uh, the application over Atom was actually overall faster than the application running locally. So the, 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 uh, to, to sum up this slide, from a technical perspective, it is, it is true that a cloud browser is uh, introducing a couple of extra steps in the, in the chain, but at the end of the day, this doesn't have any significant impact on the, on the latency in, in most cases. And a, a fundamental component in the Atom arch architecture is of course the, the thin client. And the, the key word here, the key concept is flexibility. Uh, this means that uh, uh, the Atom Thin client can run on very low end boxes. The minimal hardware requirements are extremely low. So we can, uh, we can port it and uh, integrate it successfully on uh, legacy boxes or uh, modern uh, low end cost effective boxes. And the Atom client can make use of the hardware capabilities that are available in these boxes. Uh, it's essentially a media player, so it can use the native uh, codec, the native D DRM capabilities to make sure that uh, the, the uh, like usage of hardware capabilities in the box is uh, optimized. Then if and when the set of box hardware capabilities allow this, we can enhance the Atom client. We can add our viewed uh, media player, which is uh, uh, another of our products. And if we can include that, then we can offer support for all ABR streaming protocols and DRMs. And this media player is pre-certified with all the content partners in our network. And if it's possible, we can also integrate the Atom client with uh, native OTT apps. So this means that we can uh, support very low end boxes and the system on chips on one side, but we can also increase the level of features where it is possible so that we can uh, provide a har harmonization for all kinds of boxes. But that doesn't mean that we push all of them to the bottom and we waste hardware capabilities because at the same time, we can increase the features available on the, on the boxes that allow that. Uh, so let's have a look now at some examples of where this cloud browser technology can be can be used and where it has been it has been used. So the first example is the most extensive, and uh, where you basically can support the whole set of box user interface over Atom. Uh, this means that all parts of the UI are uh, run in the cloud. And basically everything that happens on the, on the screen uh, comes from the cloud browser, from the main menu to the TV zapper, the grid guide, app store, and everything else. In this slide, we are illustrating this with some screenshots of our 
user interface, if you build OPEX, but of course the example is valid for any UI, either an uh, existing HTML5 UI or a UI that has to be designed and developed. Uh, so, so this is one uh, possible approach. It's uh, specifically interesting for IPTV operators where the box is always uh, online by definition. Then there are other examples where the main features or the main parts of the UI are implemented uh, natively and the cloud browser is used for extra features or enhancements. So for instance, uh, a typical example of, of this uh, second category of, of usage is adding OTT apps. Um, for instance, we, our viewed uh, app store, our uh, portfolio of HTML apps includes all the major apps for, for every region. And uh, um, like most of them are based on HTML5, so we can add support for them over uh, Atom. This can be done by uh, introducing an App Store concept in the, in the box, or can be done by just adding apps to the main UI experience. Um, other examples of uh, uh, extra features that can be added to an, an existing box thanks to a cloud browser are, for instance, uh, showing results from a voice assistant. In some cases, like for instance, uh, Google Assistant, this voice assistant uh, basically creates output in HTML5 form. And then you, you need to have HTML5 support on the box to be able to, to display them. <clears throat> uh, another example is uh, interactive advertisement or interactive uh, banners and uh, dialogues um, that can be added both to the UI or to the linear TV experience. Uh, especially for advertisement, but in other cases as well. All this is based on, on pre-existing uh, web content <clears throat> that is very hard to uh, adapt and optimize multiple times for every different target box. So a cloud browser solution allows to add support for all this kind of content uh, very quickly. Uh, another example is uh, adding a game gaming portal, especially for uh, casual games. Uh, here again, we are illustrating this with the, the, the viewed uh, catalog of games, but it can be done with any HTML game. Um, and the, our experience, since we provide an app store for many smart TV brands, uh, our experience is that uh, casual games are one of the most successful categories of apps. And they, they, it's, it's a very nice uh, in, enhancement to a set of box experience, which can be easily done using a cloud browser. And I, I, I also want to mention that all these last uh, examples, um, of course, they are related to features that might not be uh, vital for, for a set of box, but they are very nice uh, improvement of the experience. They can provide more stickiness to the service and in some cases, they can also increase uh, ARPU. So having a cloud browser supported in the box uh, allows the operator to uh, launch all these additional features much more easily and, and uh, 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 quickly if you compare this with uh, specific projects or specific R&D developments. And last but not least, uh, especially in Asia Pacific, it's quite successful, the T-commerce model where a, a t-commerce HTML5 application is run on TV. And of course, an HTML, an HTML5 e-commerce application is support for many use cases and features. So it's very costly and inefficient to port it and test it on every box, while a cloud browser offers a much more efficient solution to deploy it. Um, and this part of the presentation, which is the, the last couple of slides, are about some consideration on how to deploy a cloud browser and specifically the cloud part of a, of a, of a cloud browser. Now, of course, um, every case is uh, different. And so it's very hard to, to explain a one size fits all kind of solution. So I want to encourage everybody in the, in the audience to get in touch with us 
we are more than uh, uh, happy to take a discussion offline and look at a specific case. But what I can say here in general is that we have a three steps uh, process. The, the first step is to estimate the workload. And this is based on um, some key questions. Uh, how many subscribers have to be supported? How many concurrent users? How, many, uh, how much time is, is spent by these uh, subscribers in front of the TV? And how, how much time is spent on the actual UI, uh, depending on the, on the use case? And of course, it's easy to understand that all these answers will be very different for different uh, operators, different regions and use cases. Mm -hmm. But in general, our experience is that if you uh, identify a specific case, then it's, it's quite easy to find good answers to all these uh, questions. So the next step is uh, calculating how much server capacity is needed to support that workload. And this is based on our experience and data from uh, previous deployments and tests. And we have a pretty accurate uh, picture of how much, uh, how, how many UI uh, encoding tasks can be supported on a CPU, what are the typical bit rates for UI encoding in different cases and, and so on. So, so based on the, on the workload estimate, we can uh, basically calculate how much server capacity is needed and then the, the third step is to design how, how to deploy and make this server capacity available. And of course, here, the main choice is between on-premises deployment versus public cloud. And Vue.atom supports both. But more importantly, Vue.atom supports also uh, mixed deployments. And this is a very uh, interesting uh, approach, which we have seen uh, working quite, quite well. So, for uh, example, an, an operator can decide to start with a public cloud uh, deployment to minimize the setup costs and uh, time to market. Um, and then after some time, when there is a, a more experience about how the system is, is, is used and what is the average workload, then the operator can save costs by moving to an on-prem deployment especially for the average workload, but still uh, keep, uh, keep using public cloud for its auto-scaling features to, to uh, handle peaks. And or there is a, a, another interesting uh, feature in Vue.atom that allows to uh, handle extraordinary peaks or extraordinary circumstances very efficiently which is that you can, uh, in real time, configure the UI resolution and uh, frame rate. So for uh, instances, if there is an, an extraordinary peak, then you can decide to go from a 1080p UI to a 720p UI. And this has some impact on the UX, of course, but it's not, it's not major. It's a, it's a very reasonable impact. And this change allows you to basically double the CPU capacity of the of the server. So all these kind of tools are available for uh, an optimal deployment. And of course, to contain cloud costs, which is one of the key of the key principles. So in almost all cases that we have seen so far, if you do the math, and if you run through the numbers, the conclusion is that the total cost of ownership for viewed atom, including client and server over time is is lower than the uh, total cost of ownership of deploying better set of box uh, hardware, which means, of course, uh, higher capex. And let's not forget the uh, ongoing efforts and costs of continuously uh, adapting and maintaining uh, a UI on many different devices. So in a nutshell, to, to conclude the presentation part, we can sum it up and say that Vue.atom is a, a cloud browser technology that allows to de deploy a common HTML5 experience across all devices, leading to significant cost reduction, uh, uh, ensuring that the, the, the service is future-proof and can be continuously updated much faster and more uh, uh, efficiently to support more content, specifically OTT HTML5 apps, 
And all of this is done without compromising the video security in any way and actually increasing the security of the HTML5 apps because they are run uh, on, a, on a server environment which is completely isolated from the, from the device. And then I think uh, uh, this was the end of the, of the presentation. So let me uh, thank you everyone for, for, uh, for the attention. I think we have some time for uh, Q&A now. So I would like to ask Chris if we have gotten any questions during the presentation. Uh, yeah, we have one about uh, latency uh, from the point of view of Atom. Uh, the question is, what is the customer's reaction? Do they feel it's like uh, a real home TV from a latency point of view? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. Yeah, I, as as I as I said, yeah, that if if um, I mean in in most of the of the deployments, there is no real difference in how you uh, perceive a, a, a local application versus a cloud. Uh, application because the extra latency uh, introduced by by the cloud uh, setup is basically compensated by the excellent performance that the application has when running on a server and so uh, in almost all cases when you compare uh, the same application running locally on a on a mid range or low end box with the application running on the on the cloud, there's really no no not a big difference in the in the perception. And let's let's also remember that in some cases, a cloud browser is the only way to support a specific application on a target box. So in some cases, there is the possibility to make a comparison because you could see or theoretically run the same app also locally. In some other cases, you cannot make that uh, uh, comparison. So the, the cloud browser can enable more, more features. OK, um, we have a second question. Uh, the question is, you mentioned MSE slash EME. It's crucial. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I I was kind of expecting this because this is a very common uh, common question. So I I hope I will be able to give a good uh, ex explanation here in the in the in the webinar. If if I if I fail in doing that, I I do uh, encourage this person to reach out to us directly so we can have a more detail. But basically, the the key part here is the MSC API, like uh, Media Source Extension API. Uh, so the MSC APIs fundamentally means that uh, all the all the logic to download the, the video chunks and push them to the hardware uh, video decoder in an OTT uh, HTML5 application is moved from the native level up to the JavaScript level. This this, this is basically what an MSC is doing. So it it goes from under the browser to uh, on top of the browser from an architectural point of view. Now this means, but of course this is uh, this is important to support in a cloud in a cloud browser because more and more applications uh, decide to use this uh, uh, this te technology. So we can support this because we basically so split this in two parts. So the application running on the browser can still call all the uh, browser and the JavaScript APIs. Uh, to use the MSC uh, concept. So this is basically transparent for the application. But in, in our cloud browser implementation, the actual actions of downloading video chunks, measuring the uh, bandwidth and how much time is taken to get the video data, and then, of course, decoding the video data, all this part is delegated from the cloud browser to the Atom client running on the box. Uh, and this means that uh, you know the the MSC model can still work transparently when the application is is run on the on the uh, on the cloud, but the actual video data stream is sent to the box. The EME API is a little bit 
easier. Uh, this is about the DRM, of course. And the EME API is a more uh, sort of like normal type of API where the application running on the, on the server can make some JavaScript calls to the DRM client running on the box. And these calls and data is just transferred between the, the cloud browser and the, and the client over a secure channel. Um, so I, I think I'll leave it at, at, uh, at that, but yeah, it is not uh, uh, super easy to understand this. So we are more than happy to, to engage in a, in a direct discussion where we can explain in more details how, how this works. Okay, um, we have another question. Uh, this is about uh, uh, a current set-top box. Uh, what is the minimum hardware resources required to use a cloud browser? Sure, yeah. Um, well, the, the, the minimal uh, hardware requirements are very low. In the, uh, in the slides, we have uh, shared, for example, that we can run this on low-end boxes with 1,000 DMIPS and 128 megabytes of, of RAM. So those would be the, the, minimum, uh, the minimal like, requirements. Then, of course, de depending on what type of uh, uh, video, uh, video DRM are, are needed, and we might need to, to raise the requirements a little bit because, as we said, uh, a central aspect of our uh, view datum is that uh, the OTT video is sent di directly from the original server to the client. So the Atom client has to be able to uh, decrypt and, and, and play the uh, OTT video. Um, but if the, if the video is kind of normal, so it, it has basically so typical normal DRM requirements and, and uh, uh, normal uh, encoding like uh, HLS or H.264, then yeah, the, the, the minimal, like the, the uh, uh, low end box is typically okay. Okay. Uh... So that, that we have some specific uh, details on that box. So if it's an Ali N3529 with 512 megabytes of DRAM and 256 megabytes of flash, that's uh, that's enough, isn't it? Based on what you said. Yeah, that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I I'm I'm not familiar by by heart with the specific uh, system and chip. I can I can find the data sheet, but yeah, from in terms of RAM and flash, is absolutely more than enough. Yeah, absolutely yes. Okay, um, another question. Uh, what about adding different local live channels from different regions? Yeah, this is possible. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that the content mix, like uh, what type of, of uh, uh, video channels you want to add is not necessarily an, an Atom specific question, right? Because if you use our cloud browser to do that, then you would use Viewed Atom to implement a, a UI for uh, TV channel zapping or uh, TV guide. And then, the, uh, then you would show the, the like, right uh, set of channels in the, in the UI for the specific user or for, for the specific region, which is, of course, possible because every single uh, set of box has its own specific session running uh, on the server. So all the user experience can be uh, configured and per personalized very specifically from, from a UI uh, point of view. So, so this, is, uh, this is possible. And then when the end user basically selects one of the TV channels in the, in the UI, then the video player uh, starts playing that. And this is a sort of uh, normal uh, uh, linear or live uh, uh, OTT streaming. So, so when it comes to supporting uh, linear TV over OTT, uh, uh, this is basically transparent for Atom. OK, still more questions. I'm not, I, I hope we have time. Um, it says, in the implementation of your Atom solution, do you as well take responsibility end-to-end -end for upgrading all the middleware in the box? 
Uh, it says our legacy set top box does not support HTML5, so the upgrade of middleware is necessary. Would you take the action on it as well? Well, this is uh, like a tricky question, isn't it? Because of course it uh, de depends on the specific uh, case. I mean, uh, in general, uh, our the, the Atom Think client is is very lightweight, and we can adapt it on any target hardware. So, in terms of uh, technical possibility to update and, and basically add our Atom client on an existing box. I, 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 I think generally, yes, we, we take a responsibility and our, our so claim is that it is possible to port and uh, integrate the Atom client on, on almost any, any box. Now, of course, whether that is actually uh, like possible or not in a specific case, uh, also depends on some other technical and business factors, like, for instance, uh, uh, is it possible to access those boxes? Is it possible to, you know, uh, build a new firmware image for those boxes? And this answer uh, de depends on what Vue can do. And we will do, of course, the, uh, what we can, but it also depends on the overall, on the, on the other vendors in the, in the ecosystem. Uh, so I, I think we cannot take responsibility to basically uh, 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 update any set of boxes in field, no matter what. <laughs> I think I think that would be uh, too too much for me to say. But of course, uh, in most cases, we can uh, we can port our client on those boxes, and and they can be updated um, to to support it. And of course, the the key point here is that uh, it. Since the, those boxes don't support HTML5, that's exactly the reason why uh, our cloud browser is a, is a good solution. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're running out of time now. There are still a couple of questions, but maybe we can follow those up on offline. Um, just in case anybody uh, wants to review the slides after the after the webinar or actually rerun the webinar as a the, the video. Um, there will be an email sent to everybody who registered uh, containing a link to the presentation and recording. Um, and of course, if there are any other follow up questions, uh, there is a, an email address on the screen that you can use to, to contact us. Um, and uh, with that, I think uh, we're finished for today. So thank you to everyone for attending and thank you to everyone for presenting. Um, and uh, that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.